welcome. Um, today, we're going to talk about optimizing GCP security ar architecture for maximum protection. I just want to share with you the agenda we're going to cover in the next 50 minutes. We're going to talk about key risks and threats from an enterprise perspective, just to give you a perspective of what we feel is facing our clients today. We're going to share with you um, our view on what we think is a uh, Google Cloud Security Architecture model. And we'll share with you three dimensions to that. And then we thought it would be interesting to have a fireside chat. We've invited someone from Google to join my colleague and I to go through a fireside chat to try and guess the questions that are in your head today. And then we're going to end on a key takeaway slide, some of the key lessons that we want to bring to today's session. So with that, today's presenters, my name is Shahid Latif. I'm a partner um, in PwC's cloud security practice focused on Google. Um, with me today will be joining Gokul uh, and Rob from, from Google. Um, a fun fact about me, I've done an 80 mile backpack in New Mexico, carrying 50 pounds over 10 days. Very tough, across three large mountains, and um, really tested my, my stamina. Enjoyed it a lot. But Gokul, why don't you introduce yourself? Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gokul Raghuraman. I'm a director in our PwC's advisory group uh, focused on cloud transformation and cloud security. Um, so fun fact, um, I always wanted to skydive, but never really had the guts to do it. So I thought, why don't I do it in a safe environment? And I picked this one. It turned out really fun. I really wanted to go back again, but that's something that I wanted to do. Yeah. Thanks. So let's talk about key risks and threats to the cloud. Um, we thought we'd start with a, a little bit of a privacy and regulatory feel to it. And what we've done at PwC is we've analyzed the market. We've, we've looked at almost every single country in the world, and we've identified a number of drivers, environmental drivers, international law, US law and regulations, enforcement and case law, and self-regulation and standards. And you can see some of the examples on here, and there's man many more. What we find with our clients when we talk to them, they really don't have enough insights because of the global nature of the complexity of regulation. And sometimes it's important to understand it. So we have developed a point of view in almost all these countries and have it in a repository at our fingertips. We don't need to spend hours and weeks researching it. We have it at our fingertips. And we think that's an important attribute to begin the cloud journey to really understand that, especially when you talk about data localization and where data might physically reside. So what's the value, though, of understanding all that regulation? What's is there a, what's the impact if you, do, if you have non-compliance? We think there's four broad areas of, of non-compliance risks. The first is regulatory fines and penalties, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. But you might be subject to an FTC order. There's been a number of consumer breach, uh, breaches that have occurred that have resulted in, in decade long or multiple decades of orders where you have to do audits for the next 20 years in some cases. Um, some business operations might be limited. So it could have a big impact from a regulatory perspective. Financial risk, you could have loss of revenue. You could have litigation costs, which is often the case in some breaches. Civil and criminal and penalties for data breaches as well. There's also an reputational risk, and that's a big discussion. There's so many breaches in it today that have occurred. Some people have been numb to it. Share prices don't really get impacted much. But does your reputation get impacted? In some cases, they could, especially if you're heavily reliant on an online presence or heavily dependent on technology where security is really paramount. You might even lose loss of confidence in your employees and start to get turnover. And then finally, operational risk. Restricting operations, um, having the, the ability to Im transferring data in an inappropriate way, or having an innocent response program um, having sort of remediation or obligations to the instant response program that didn't meet it. So these are some of the non-compliance um, regs that you have to be careful of. I um, want to turn quickly to some key considerations. We try to summarize this in a page, which is very difficult. But we think these are like the main themes that we keep seeing over and over again at our clients. Governance and keeping pace. Often, cybersecurity is not always at the seat of the table. When it comes to architectural discussions, um, IT may be at the front, or business might be at the front. Rarely do I see sometimes cyber at the seat of the table. And with cl Google Cloud adoption, you have to be. Collaborating on that solution together to, make, to enhance enablement of agility through a DevOps environment, and we'll talk later about some, our thoughts around secure development, it's really important to bring that mentality that cyber is an equal partner in the, in the discussion. And, and, in, and modernizing the employee skill sets. 
time and time again, we go to our clients, we find there's not enough resources that know this subject. And we get called upon to either augment the team or bring our specialized skill sets to the table. Identity access management. Um, you probably have attended some of the sessions over the last two days around this topic. But it, when you're in a multi-cloud environment, it's quite complex to deal with. And throw on top of that legacy applications as well. So centralizing the identi identity, both user and device, using MFA and PAM are three really important topics to address. Data protection and compliance. I mentioned earlier that all the regulations that's out there, especially here since we're all here in California today, the CCP Act is having a big impact on a lot of my clients, especially those with a lot of consumer data. They're having to understand now where is data, who's access to it, and how do they use it? And if I have to delete it, how can I delete it? So it's really important to have a, a, an effective program around it. Legacy services, um, what's the path for data migration from legacy apps to a workload that's going into the cloud? Uh, how do you deal with data in transit? How do you encrypt it the right way? And then preservation response. Do you understand the roles and responsibilities of the cloud provider? You might know that upfront during early discussions, but as you get into month three, month six, month the second year, are you really clear on what happens if there's a breach? Who's responsible for what? What are the SLAs around that? It's really important to know. want to quickly talk, now jump into something we've created at PwC that's based on three basic principles. We, we looked hard, and we have a concept called strategy through execution when we deliver our solutions to a client. So when it came to Google Cloud, we said we want to approach it in three dimensions. A technical architecture, which is um, probably a lot of what you saw in, in this conference. But we also feel it strongly on a process architecture and a controls architecture. All three have to come together and have to be linked. And that's what our view is around bringing it all together into one place. So I'm going to share with you the next few slides how we've approached this topic. The first one is controls, which is relatively easy. We've adopted NIST 853. We think that's the most comprehensive framework out there, especially here in the US. It's the, the most stringent baseline to go after. We've coupled it, obviously, with CS CIS version 7, because there's a lot of the technical hardening standards that you would have. We mapped them both together, created specific controls for GCP, and we've identified which ones are really critical and non-critical. And we also related which ones are really technically automated, possible through automation, which ones are really process or workflow oriented, and which ones rely on people to follow. We also took it one step further. And we worked out which ones are really native to within GCP and which ones are not. Often our clients want to maximize as much as possible from Google Cloud. And what we've done is try to identify that early up. So having this framework, we have a baseline of which to measure our adoption against. So we think this is one important attribute to have it defined. And you can see the categories below. I won't go through them all. You can see them and present in front of you. But this illustrates um, the dimensions of controls that you need to address. I want to spend a few minutes on this slide, because this is our 10 o'clock architecture. Underneath this, we have um, content that talks about what does gut like from an architectural perspective. Um, we don't want to change too much of what's already in the on-premise world. But what we've done is translated what does it mean to being in the cloud. So let me walk you through how we've addressed this 10 o'clock architecture. First, we use the NIST CSF domains through identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. We feel that most of our clients, especially at the board level, understand that terminology. So we use that lens to translate an executive level. Here are the different campaigns and programs that we're trying to do using those domains. How do we measure success? We measure success through, th through that lens. We also want to take into account the, the technology stack of the cloud environment. So whether it's compute, network, storage, logging, monitoring, IM, we look at it from that lens and making sure we address those components. At the top, we also want to be aware of the security risks. So these are inputs to each of our technical requirements that we defined. Visibility, business awareness, compliance, data security, threat protection, cloud IM, incident response, vendor landscape, cloud DevOps, vendor management, cloud API security, and infrastructure security. We think it's important that our model fully addresses those risks, and they're embedded in our technical architecture. So I'll walk you through them, and then I'm going to ask Gokul to share some client experiences. So for example, IT asset management. At a high level, everyone knows that inventory is important. How do you do that in a cloud when assets don't last more than maybe a few hours or a few weeks? 
How do I get around that? And if I have to go back and investigate, how do I deal with that? Threat and vulnerability management. Um, clients are struggling sometimes in this space. How do, you, how do you do a penetration test in GCP? And how do you do this on a regular basis? What tools are available for you to, to allow for that? Data protection. How do we make sure that um, the data that's there in the cloud is protected according to your policies? Logging and monitoring. Um, it's really important to define it. So most of my clients have a multi-cloud environment. What's the single source of truth when it comes to the repository? How do we create a data lake that will give us the visibility that we need and in a real-time fashion? Instant response. So if, the, if you ever do have a breach of whatever nature, how do you respond quickly? Business continuity and disaster recovery. How do we make sure that you can recover quickly? We, we ourselves are actually in the middle of researching some new ways of looking at resiliency. So we're looking at new tech, actually leveraging some of Google tech around how do we quickly assess the dependencies on different assets that are in the cloud. Governance and compliance. Um, important point about governance is who owns cloud architecture? Who approves cloud architecture? When it comes to service level approvals, where do you get that defined? And now you get a blurring between operations, security, and development. How do you bring all that together in a, in a defined way that doesn't bring down your, your levels of security controls. Security development lifecycle. Um, you may be surprised to hear that companies are struggling with adopting a, an SDLC that's applicable to a cloud-like environment. Risk assurance and management. How do you assure your customers, your third parties, that you've got a, a safe environment? IEM, identity and access management. I've talked about it already, but central theme, who, how you co control access into the cloud. Awareness and training, and, and finally, network security. So I just wanted to spend a little bit of time walking through each one, but I'm going to ask uh, Gokul now just, just to share some examples of some of our client experiences as we've used this, this framework. Sure, sure, absolutely. So I'm going to take a couple of uh, domains here, and then we'll talk about specific customer examples um, where we've been asked to come in and help, and that's resulted in our developing this kind of a framework to help out in future engagements. So um, one of the first things that we typically look at is what does a customer have in their cloud environment? We recently were brought in um, for a client who wanted to do a very quick assessment on their environment and look at their readiness of their environment. Right. The first thing that we ask them is, okay, what are you running on the cloud? What are your assets? What are your resources? A lot of our clients have a little uh, have an inventory available which they can use, but a lot of the times that's not accurate, right? And in the cloud, um, with the scalability and the elasticity to it, there are resources up and going up and down all the time. So how do you how are you going to have a framework and a process in place to be able to measure and track that or a consistent period of time, right? So I think. Um, the key on the Google side is GCP has already provided some native capabilities like labeling. They have the uh, security command center that's now integrated with their asset lifecycle that you can leverage to enable tagging on your resources, identifying what resources. And, and you build a very simple schematic model which says, here is my resource, here is what it's used, who's the owner, what is the environment, what is the purpose of that, and you have some level of data classification associated to that. So once you have established that model, that then becomes your baseline, and y you start slowly building automation on top of that, right? So once you have that automation, it's very easy to start building policies on top of that, and you start enforcing those policies. So the first thing that we typically ask customer is, um, what is your asset inventory? And I would recommend you know, uh, looking at your policies and your uh, resource management lifecycle to set up those labeling policies in place. Um, another example that we commonly run into when we walk into a customer is traditionally you have these engineering teams, the security team, then you have the app development team doing separate roles. right? As you go into the cloud with all the automation in place, those lines have started blurring all the more now, right? So you need a, a proper methodology and a process in place to be able to say, how am I going to automate my infrastructure? How am I going to provision my infrastructure? How do I embed security as part of my development lifecycle, right? So somebody is running containers or somebody else is having traditional workloads. How do I ensure a consistent process that is baked in as part of my build and release pipeline, right? So that's another thing that, um, 
we commonly notice and uh, we recommend coming up with a proper process in place that works not only on your on-prem environment as well as on your cloud environment. And typically once you have established the process, that can be uh, tailored very quickly to any of the cloud providers that you have. So that's a couple of examples that I had in mind. Um, so at this point of time, I would like to invite uh, Rob from Google to join us for a quick uh, fireside chat. Thanks, Gokul, and thanks, Shahid. Um, so my name is Rob Sadowski. I work in the uh, product marketing organization here at Google Cloud on security and trust. And my team really develops a lot of the uh, initial message when we engage with customers around security, helping to educate them about what are the capabilities that are inherent in our platforms, um, what are the different control objectives that we can help them meet, um, how can we help them with key security processes like security monitoring, like IAM, um, like you know those the core disciplines of any security program. And I guess in the spirit of uh, sharing fun facts, one of the things that I like to do is, uh, is see live music, see concerts. The concert was great last night. Hopefully everyone got to, got to catch some of that. Um, seen a number of my favorite bands hundreds of times, so that's what I like to do if I'm not doing security. So, cool. Cool. So I think now, Rob, what we'll do is turn to a fireside chat. We, we try to think about questions that people in the audience might be thinking of. So Rob, why don't you start and um, we'll see where we go. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the interesting thing is that you have gone through these implementations with many different types of clients. And so early on in those um, engagements, just when they're considering cloud, or whether they're considering GCP, I mean, you talked about technology, you talked about controls, you talked about process. Um, where, are the, wh where are the biggest challenges early on in the, I in the engagement or early on in the process for people who may be either starting that journey or who are very early on um, in you know, considering this? It's, it's actually an interesting question because um, often we get the inside look before even Google gets to the door. Yeah. Some of my largest clients, we get asked all the time, is this the right product? Is this the right solution? So before even a cloud provider gets to the table, we're asked, does it meet the security requirements? Mm -hmm. And often the ROI is quickly addressed. That's not an issue because that's why we're at the table. Um, is this the right transformation process? Absolutely. But the fundamental question that's always the biggest lagger, is it meeting my security policies? Mm -hmm. And often what we find is that client's security policies are written in a way that doesn't translate to a Google-like environment. And so we're having to translate their requirements and what they're trying to do to what the platform is going to bring them. And in some cases, yes, they might quite be there, but nine times out of 10, there's a translation required. Yeah. And so what we have been asked to do more often than not is go in and try and understand that complexity and bring simplicity, because that's the other side to the equation, bring the simplicity and, and understand what the risks and the vulnerabilities, but more importantly, the strengths that it brings as well. Right. I mean, you, you talked about basing your work on frameworks, um, like, like the NIST framework, whether it's the CSF or some of the control matrices. I mean, do you see people basing their own policies around some uh, around domains like that, or do they tend to be do they tend to be looser? <laughs> so it, it has varied. So um, I can give you a story of a client, um, Fortune 15. So I keep it within top 15. I will tell you which one. Um, I showed up three years ago at this client. They created their policies on input from legal, input from operations, but proprietary built, mm. was built of their own thinking. They asked me to come in and evaluate, not that, but more their posture overall. And we concluded what the most important thing was to do is to actually base it on a recognized framework. There we use NIST CSF. Mm. Uh, and more often than not, we're finding NIST being the most common framework to be used. ISO is still relevant, especially from a global side, but the NIST is the most relevant one. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons why at you know at Google Cloud we try to do um, or we commit to getting certifications among the most popular international frameworks. And you know, so if someone is basing you know their set of controls and how they how they meet policy obligations based on something like ISO 27001, or and then how that how that gets translated through, there's often a direct mapping that they can use to help them understand um, you know within in the confines of a shared responsibility model, what we're going to be doing, what they're going to be doing, and then we can also map out to, um, to, to other controls there. Two of the things I want to mention, though, there are the challenges with our clients in the early adoption is, do I have the right technical competency to it? Mm -hmm. Again, a, a big percentage of our clients are building those resources out, but they want to retool their current staff to do it. Mm -hmm. 
which means they need a leader and a change agent within the ranks to be able to pull it through. And, and more often than not, sometimes they rely on a third party to, to fill in that gap sometimes. Um, not always, but sometimes. But eventually they have to find that, that director, that leader, the, the whoever it is to really drive it to completion. Do you find that, that as organizations look to, look to do some of this, that they are looking to actually um, bring existing control? Like, what, you know, they have a control objective, but are they trying to bring existing controls, or are they re-looking at what is offered you know, in the cloud? And I think we're going to talk about some of this um, to say, okay, we can replace this existing control um, that we have in place, you know, this, it, it may be based on a particular product of how they meet that obligation with something cloud-native. I think it's mentioned throughout this conference, transformation. They want to automate. Automation is like the key to their success. They don't want a compliance audit. They don't want controls. They want to automate, which is a lot of what we're going to talk about later. They want to automate the process that's involved in managing the environment. They don't want to have hands on. They, they don't want people involved. They want to have machines really do it for them. Mm. And some of the companies we're dealing with, the size that they do, they, ha they don't have a choice of the scale and the magnitude they have to deal with. Now, sounds good, is that possible today? I think it is, is it, a, is it done right now? No, everyone's trying to get to that level. Right, okay. So maybe I can ask you a question, Rob, just in return. We've heard a lot of uh, exciting announcements throughout the week. I've talked about some of the challenges, but what are the, some of the things that have taken your fancy from what you've seen this week that really will help clients out there today? Well, it, 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 that's a, it's a great segue, Shad, because I think you, know, you talked about transformation and modernization of security controls and capabilities. I mean, obviously what we uh, announced with Anthos, where there is a lot of security capability that is built in there, whether um, it's, a, it's functionality like what's in Istio, you know, so you can um, create and monitor um, um, microservices, that you can ensure that you have um, encryption between those different services, that you can automate configurations, uh, you know, the, the capability like configuration management where you are able to um, define certain policies, instantiate those policies, and make sure those are pushed out at scale and make sure things don't deviate. It's, it's critically, I think, important uh, as part of, especially as organizations begin to scale, to make sure that they're adhering to policies, that they're following good governance and so forth. So I think that was one. I think the second, you know, Gokul, you, you mentioned Cloud Security Command Center, and I think that visibility into risk is something that many organizations really, um, r really have been focused on. As they move into the cloud, how do I really understand um, the risk profile of the assets that are there? So the fact that um, now in this service, you get a full organization-wide view of all your assets and then can begin to look at the risk profile of each of those different assets and kind of what the, some of the other capabilities where, where we brought on, something like um, security health analytics, where we can say, for those assets, are they configured in such a way that is creating um, inordinate level of risk? Like, do we have storage buckets with you know broad permissions that may be open to the internet? Do we have overly permissive firewall rules? Do we have things that again would put me in a situation where I would not be able to um, meet the objective of a, of a given policy? And I think back to the automation point, um, you know, something we talked about in terms of event threat detection. How can we help automate or at least provide some of the labor in the detection process? So taking being being able to take the logs, and I think we're going to talk about logging and, and monitoring here in a minute, but being able to take that and actually use um, intelligence that we've gathered to give you uh, a sense of are there particular um, malicious events or signs of compromise that you need to look for. And I think the, 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 the final or, you know, a, a couple others, I think, around identity. You know, I think that in terms of good governance and implementing policies, identity is still one of the biggest control points that we have in cloud, that where we may not be able to implement some of the controls that we, we have wanted them to um, in terms of the network because services are moving up the stack that we're looking, you know, less and less at layer three and four and more and more at layer seven, that how can we, um, how can really you know get those uh, get that level of control in the environment and knowing who's in the environment, being able to manage that access appropriately throughout its life cycle, 
Um, and right at the beginning of that, it's authentication. So the fact that we introduced the kind of um, Android, being able to use the Android phone as a security key, um, establishing that root, um, that root trusted identity at the, at the beginning, I think is uh, really, really important. So those are, those are a few that stood out, especially within the context of what, we are, what we're doing here in terms of um, being able to implement strong controls and strong governance across the platform and really see how effective those are. You know, one thing that stood out to me in addition to what you've just said is the training aspect. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to see there's a security certification now eventually out because I think that's absolutely needed out there. Yeah, I mean, if, if folks didn't see that, um, basically the, the week before we talked, uh, we introduced a, a specific security certification for GCP and there's a set of coursework um, that you can go and get that specialization. And so I think, um, and a lot of that is driven by um, demands that we have had. You know, we, we want to have more education about the different security capabilities and how they might be applied. And so that's a really strong, I think, um, start as you begin to delve more deeply into these issues. Great. So going back to you, Shed, and, and, and Gokul, you know, when, when you know, you've gotten to the part of, of advisory where people have decided to get into cloud and they, they are saying, okay, we have this workload, we have this type of data, um, what, are the, what are they actually looking to get you know, in terms of payoff, right? Is it security? I mean, w w there's, this, there's this belief, I think, that has evolved over time that moving to the cloud can actually make you more, um, potentially increase your security posture or allow you um, to implement stronger or better governance. Um, is that part of it, or is it is it still something else? So th there are a number of drivers, and I think it varies according to the industry you're in, and, it co and also the type of company you are in terms of your style of management. But more often than not, ROI is one of the first drivers out there, and, and often it's a data center rationalization issue. Some of my clients have recognized maintaining a data center today is really expensive, not to mention I've got to make it secure. So that drives into a conclusion, I've got to move more things into the cloud. And then the question becomes, what workloads can I put there? Um, over the years, it's been ver very slow, but I see now, I, I worked with a FinTech client re just recently, they moved their entire production and all their entire platform into Google Cloud and, and went live. And so those things are changing, but I still there's a m still a bigger majority of clients that have yet not yet adopted cloud. So I think there's huge growth potential still. So uh, absolutely ROI, but the other thing is transformation. They're, they're eager to leverage some of the MI and, and the artificial intelligence capability within compute to really harness business transformation. That, even more than agility, is driving some of the adoption. And those use cases are driving the transformation that which driving our business as well. Yeah. So, so, so let me push on that, on, on that point a little bit. I mean, do you see clients who feel that moving to the cloud either you know, enhances their security posture or allows them to have stronger, um, more effective governance? A personal view rather than a firm view, just sure. because I don't want to say too much on the firm half, but I f personally believe that from my experience, and I've been in, in security consulting over 30 years, that um, going to a, a reputable cloud solution, such as Google, is actually more beneficial than trying to build it yourself. Mm. And um, when you think about the complexities of the emerging tech that's about to hit us, um, you need to be with a provider that can give us that capability. Okay. So Rob, how does Google, initially at the beginning when you're adopting cloud, um, Google Cloud, how do you help in those initial stages in, in creating those business cases? And how do you help to meet their internal clients, especially on the first few months when they're getting off the ground. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a nice segue, right? Because one of the things that we that we try to do is is show that level of security enhancement or security benefit. So, typ um, you know, typically what would happen very early on, we understand what are the different types of services or what is the workload or what is the, what is the application. And from there, we understand a little bit more about the business process. We understand a little bit more about the type of data. And then what we want to do, back to kind of what you were saying and why I was asking about that, is understand what are the security policies that are around that data. And where, where it gets challenging in some cases is that if the policy isn't particularly well defined, Right, or if there aren't stated control objectives, because what we like to then do is be able to um, give an overview or give a sense of, okay, here's how you can use the features in the platform to protect this. Right, here's how you can meet your obligations from an internal policy or also from potentially an external regulatory perspective in the ways that we can help. Right, and that's where um, we talk about the relevant certifications or the relevant documents.
documentation we have around some of those different things. An another, so we really like to have the security conversation up front because we know that it becomes harder and harder to drive change if there are questions about risk, there, if there are questions about um, you know, being able to meet uh, obligations and guidance and so forth. So I think that that's a, that's a big part of it. Another thing that we like to do early on in the, um, in, in the uh, engagement is to um, e even go far as to do workshops. And that may be you know, with, with, with partners like yourselves or internally with our folks where, again, we look at um, internal policies. We interview stakeholders. We understand um, security objectives. Um, we do some assessment of existing controls because sometimes um, you know, the, the, the as-is environment doesn't match the desired future state. And so we can do a little bit of um, solutioning and designing a ahead of time and then um, kind of come up with a roadmap as to some of the things that are must implements and then, and then phase for other pieces. So um, that's what we try to do early on. But clearly, security has to be an integrated part of that of that design decision. I mean, just like the the philosophy of you know when we are doing CI/CD, shifting security left, right? It's it's, it's shifting security left in the engagement itself. So we are we are planning and not saying, oh, now we have this workload. Wait, you know, how are we going to meet the meet the obligations that we have? Do you find who is the most engaging party when you go to a client? Which function, security, IT, business that you feel most closest to it, it, it has to be all the above, but I, I mean, I think that, that what we see the most is the, the, the security function is seen as the, as the, the team or the, the, the center that is going to sign off on a lot of what happens, so that's where a lot of the gravity is. But again, in doing interviews and understanding that, we have to understand from the business side and from other parts who have influence over it, because everyone needs to be bought in. And I, I don't know how familiar you are with the three-day discovery programs. I just recently found out that, that you actually spend three days with a client and actually do workshops and educate them around security. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a, it's a kind of workshopping process where we can do some education about the controls and contextualize it um, in, in terms of the, the, the existing business. Okay. Let's see. So what, what else did I want? So again, getting more to the specific um, controls and, t and technologies, um, what, are the, what are the biggest challenge in terms of the technical side? You know, what s specific security controls or pieces of functionality are they looking to implement and are they challenged to implement? So DLP yeah. was one, and that just recently got embedded into the roadmap within there. But again, one of my clients was challenged. It wasn't available at the time, but now it, it is. But DLP is, was one challenge, and that's really important when you deal with privacy matters. Mm -hmm. um, SIM and UBA. <coughs> so within stride of threat and fraud detection, UBA is really important, use behavior analytics. And how do you use an existing SIM platform using Stackdriver or the Security Command Center? How do I use that with their existing platform that might have? Um, container security, and obviously Anthos is a great example of bringing a multi-cloud feature to it, but managing your operations around the new technology that brings will be interesting. Um, end endpoint detection and response. Um, that's a challenge for most clients, even on on-premise. How do you do it in a virtual environment? And how do you get real-time uh, indications of what's going on in that space? Firewall real processes. Um, changes made to firewalls when you're in a dev environment are made very quickly, but may not be done right. One of my other clients that I worked with, they changed their firewalls really quickly to the point where it created problems because they're in a dev environment making quickly. So how do you create controls around changes? Which sounds obvious, but I'm talking about a live example that that wasn't the case. Um, and then configuration management, that's the other one. With so many configurations, the ability to make so many changes, how do you manage that? Can that be scripted? Can we control that? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that clearly the 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 rapidity, which w you know, the ease of making changes allows you know, which is great because it allows you to be responsive, but it also um, can cause configuration drift and other things like that. So we try to, um, and that's a technology side thing, and it's also a process side thing. But it's certainly not something to be underestimated, and I think we we see that as well. So maybe, s what are the native yeah. solutions within GCP that you think can address some of the things I just brought up? Yeah, I mean, I mean, clearly we have a lot of controls that can address many of those different types of things. You talk about behavior. Um, an analysis and things like that. One of the things we talked about this week was um, our policy intelligence tool. 
um, that, that, that we're bringing out. And so one of the things that we're doing there is looking at the set of IAM roles that have been defined and then looking at access that's happening and being able to say, are, is there a mismatch? So even if a role is defined correctly, we can say, These this group of users have not accessed this resource. Should we remove this permission? So you know, getting to more effective governance based on user behavior um, and, and looking at that over time. I think, you, you know, as you mentioned, container security, there are a number of capabilities we talked about. We talked uh, th this week about um, what we are doing around container registry vulnerability scanning, so being able to scan um, for vulnerabilities in the development process and um, provide attestations of whether particular components um, or other underlying uh, things have vulnerabilities in them. And then very much related to that is um, a tool that is now GA called binary authorization. So in that process, making sure that um, code is signed and checked through based on a variety of criteria before it actually goes to the, to the deploy state. So this whole idea of um, giving you tooling to control um, and get oversight over your software supply chain is critically important as organizations kind of transform and modernize some of these dev processes. And those, those are two you know, capabilities that are, uh, that are kind of built in there. So let, let's take a pause for a minute because Gokul's been quiet on the end and want to bring him in. So um, I want to deep dive a little bit more into identity access management because I think it's a core capability that needs to be really thought through. Maybe Gokul, I'm going to uh, sh share a slide that you can maybe illustrate. Tell us a little bit more about what you need to have to have an effective IAM an initiative. Sure. So, so IAM is one of the core tenets of when we go into a customer in, um, site and they want to build out their cloud transformation program, IAM is one of the core foundational capabilities that we start with, right? So uh, if, if you don't get the IAM and the resource hierarchy right, then it causes a bigger challenge as you start scaling up your business. So some of the basic tenets as we look at IAM is how do you organize your resources in Google? What are the different capability services that are available out of the box? What considerations you need to be thinking about when you, as you organize your projects and your folder structure and your resource structure in your Google environment is the first thing that we look at. So what do I mean by that? Google has a resource hierarchy um, which starts with organization resource and then there's folders and then there's projects and then there's um, resource, underlying resources, uh, compute, your network, all those resources. So typically, when we go in and at the root level, organization is the node that uh, customers typically start with, right? And if you're a G Suite, um, if you have a G Suite account or a cloud identity account, that organization resource is available to you. The advantage of that resource is you can now start tying your policies um, and your controls at the organization level, right? You don't. Uh, in some cases, it's actually beneficial. You don't have to duplicate them across multiple projects. So that's the root level that you get. And, and typically, if, if you once you start that organization level, any projects that you create are then automatically associated to that domain, and then as part of that, associated to your organization. So if somebody leaves your organization, you already have that associated to your organization. It follows the organization and not the individual who's actually leaving the uh, organization, right? So from an administrator perspective, it, it's centralized management. It allows you to manage your resources and your controls and the policies in a centralized manner. So that's why having that organizational resource helps you set the precedence. So then we have this concept of folders resources, right? So a lot of times our customers uh, want to segregate their uh, projects by functional units, by departments, by environments. So that's where the concept of folders is very helpful. So I might have a marketing department. I might have another legal department. I, don't, I want specific policies associated to that. I want projects which have specific controls, IAM policies related only for that particular department. Right. So that's where I use the concept of folders to group similar functional units or similar um, functions together as part of the folder structure. Then you have the actual project, which, which derives from the folder, right? And folder is an optional level. You don't have to need uh, have that folder structure. But we typically recommend that if you want to bunch or group together similar functional units. At the project level, that's where the real work actually happens. That's when you stand up your resources, you spin up your applications. That's where you deploy everything, right? So the project is the primary control that you have. Now, 
once you have set up this organizational structure in place, typically our customers say, so what is a recommended project structure that I need to have? Do I need to have it by environment? Do I need to have it by department? Again, typical answer is it depends, right? So if you are an organization, um, unless you have very specific requirements that say one, um, so let's say I have an um, organization and there is another organization which has completely different set of policies and functions and I want complete isolation, that's when you'll really need two separate organizations. Otherwise, one organization is the way to go, one domain is the way to go. And then from a project level, that's where you start segregating projects. So I could have projects created for dev environment, for my QA or my production environment, or I could also slice it in a different way, say, I need my project structure to be set up by my functional units. By marketing, you have a certain set of project hierarchy. You have certain users, roles, policies assigned by that functional unit. So that's the way that we typically look at. So once you get that right, then you start thinking about the con uh, concept of identity and roles, right? So really, there is two kinds of identity in GCP. One is the user identity, and then there is the service account identity, right? So users are pretty much all your users, the individual users who are going to be using the environment, so that's straightforward. The service accounts are slightly tricky. So they are typically used if you want to perform an operation on behalf of another user, on behalf of an application. That's when service accounts are typically used. Um, you can use it as an identity as well as a resource, right? So what I mean by that is, so let's say I want to have some kind of a notification or an automated job that is one of, I want to be running in the background. I don't want to, want to be running it as an individual user. That's when the concept of service account actually applies. So it, 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 it's very critical at a high level when you, before you start uh, moving all your workloads to the cloud or before you set up your workloads on the cloud, to ensure that you have the IAM structure built out, you have your users, roles, and policies that are clearly mapped out, and then you start you know, migrating your data and uh, set up your projects in place. Yeah. So um, Rob, anything specific from an identity perspective that uh, Google is working on, any of the announcements? Well, I think that I think you gave a good overview here. I think one thing that I talked about in terms of policy intelligence, I talked a little bit about um, making recommendations. There's also a, uh, a complementary piece called Access Troubleshooter. That so as you set up roles and as you set up permissions, if something isn't able to be accessed, Troubleshooter can help you walk through and figure out exactly why. So you don't wind up saying just um, you know grant all privileges, right? So you can continue to adhere to those particular uh, to those particular things, and then and we've made a, you know, a number of other announcements around um, our own cloud identity where a lot of times we set up those accounts or the ability to use um, Active Directory and use that as a, as a managed service. So those were a couple of, couple of things, but I think especially in terms of what we are doing around policy intelligence, helping you get those permissions and helping you make sure that you are continuing to enforce things like least privilege um, effectively across multiple things. That's, so that's actually um, very good because what we have noticed is a lot of the times our users have set up these predefined roles and the uh, users already set up, but a lot of times they're not even using those roles. So the idea is to have fine-grained roles and uh, policies associated to that. Uh, we typically, our, a lot of our clients start with the traditional primitive roles which are no longer recommended, right? So then you have the predefined roles which, are, which give you those bunching of those policies, which is good, but really the custom roles is where you get the full power of Google, right? You will be able to automate what exactly what permission set a particular user is required to use, right? With this new um, implementation that Google has come out with, you already have a way that Google is going to tell you, hey, you have this user, you have assigned these permissions, but it's not required, you're not using them, so start taking it back, right? So that's very helpful. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the other analog shed is so now we, we understand, you know, and, and are trying to gain control over those users, but we also have to audit that activity. And so monitoring and logging is something, Shed, you, you know, you, yep. you referred to at the beginning. What are your kind of best practices or thinking around that as you work with clients around monitoring, logging, um, and being able to provide that, that, that documentation? Absolutely. So, um, Traditionally, all of our customers have some kind of a logging and monitoring solution on-prem, right? So they, they want to leverage the same solution as they go to the cloud as well, and a lot of times that will work, right? But by, by default, Google already provides you capabilities like Stackdriver, which will let you 
um, look at the logs. The uh, logs are automatically enabled. They are automatically stored in Stackdriver. And you have a way to collect it, export it, and then do some analytics on top of it. Right? So at, at the base infrastructure layer level, you already have tools like Stackdriver which will let you do that. Then you'll need to start looking at what kind of application level logs and monitoring that I'll have to manage. And then finally, you'll look at, from a business transparency perspective, what are the business metrics and the logs that I need to be starting to collect, right? So those are the three levels that I would typically start looking at. The, uh, the other good thing in Google is, uh, and I know you can talk a little bit about the access transparency, but really, when, when we go to a customer, and it goes back to how we structure our projects. So typically, we would have a security SecOps engineering team which is focused on primarily looking at the audit events, looking at the security events that are happening. So the way that you structure your projects, again, is very critical. So you would have your engineering teams focus on a separate project structure. All your security logging and all those logs will be managed in a separate project, and only your security engineering team gets access to that. Right. So there is clear separation of duties. You have a way to monitor who gets access to the logs. Um, and you can report it on if, you know, if there is unauthorized access to the logs. Again, um, some of the things that we have seen as best practices go with fine-grained roles, give absolutely minimum permissions, start with the editor role, because editor is required in a lot of cases for you to be able to manage the logs and uh, do some kind of instrumentation from the logs. So start there and then um, you know, expand from those capabilities. By default, also, another question that comes up is our customers ask, I store all these logs. Are these logs encrypted? Are they stored in a safe manner? By default, when they are stored in your cloud storage buckets, they are all encrypted by default. You have a way to actually use your secret management capabilities to manage access to those logs. So those are some of the high-level best practices that we recommend as we look at logging and monitoring as we uh, work with our clients. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what Google has provided? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that just one thing you talked about, separation of logs by project and being able to get that granularity. I think everyone is, if you're not aware, they're actually, when we think about cloud audit logging, three distinct set of logs. There are admin activity logs, which allow you to see what administrators are doing. There's kind of uh, system event logs, which, you know, if you're starting something on Compute Engine, what are the different things? Like if, if a live migration happens, when did that happen, for example? There are also data access logs. So you can see, um, not only from an administrative perspective, but also from a user perspective, people who roles or permissions when that data is, has been accessed. So that there's a nice real separation between those. So depending on what you're looking for and what you are going to have to provide documentation on, the different types of logs can support that. And then we also augment that. And you know that's for your own users and your own administrators. But we augment that with access transparency logs. So this is an optional feature that you can turn on, which allows you to see if Google support engineers or administrators are accessing any of your data. So that you know helps with with the overall understanding of what's happening in my environment, you know, being able to provide a full log of, um, or near full log of access uh, of that. And so that kind of complements that piece. And another thing we talked about, you know, that many um, organizations have existing log management systems and capabilities, um, things like a, like a Splunk or other systems like that. In Cloud Security Command Center, we've actually a lot, uh, put a, uh, added capabilities in the, in the GA release to support direct connection to that with this um, with this Splunk connector. So if that's where you're doing some of the reporting and auditing, you can get events um, from there. So um, yeah, I mean, clearly an area that we've focused. So maybe to wrap this up, Shed, yep. you know, are there specific tools or um, frameworks or other things that you use specifically with um, with your clients in driving through some of these issues? Sure, I've just summarized them here quickly on the slide to speed up our discussion. So. As I mentioned before, and we gave a very high-level representation in the earlier slides, but we created a architectural blueprint. We've actually worked with clients where they've asked us, tell us what good looks like from an architectural perspective. So we already have pre-designed templates around what architecture should look like. We then tailor that to the needs of the client. And that's uh, been a huge success for us in trying to accelerate the program. And that, again, process, controls, and technology. We look at all three elements. Um, we also make sure that the controls that we apply distinguish between what's available in Google and what's not. And that's really important to know because we've also developed an understanding of the vendor ecosystem. A lot of our clients say, where is the best tool to use? What's the right thing to use here? We developed a point of view on that. We've developed a selection of criteria against different functions and then a Harvey Ball analysis around that and developed a portfolio. 
it's hard to keep up because there's a lot of new third-party products out on the market, but we've got that as well at our, at our disposal. The, the other thing we have is we've developed a tool because often um, we can put a tool that's already available, but it takes time to put that there. So we developed some scripts of our own based again on benchmarks that are available in the industry, CIS namely, and we run our scripts and quickly find out whether things are hard in the right way in the VM level. And then finally, best practices. We've created a library because we've been to a few clients now. We, we've captured best practices. So we don't have to repeat the best practices. Uh, it's hard to keep up with all the changes that are going on with Google. But as we do, we keep updating for that as well. So um, we're almost done here. You know, Gokul or, or Shed, you know, if you had to make you know, a couple of key uh, takeaways or recommendations around, uh, around this and architecting and build, what, what would they be? I think it's these four or five basic things. Understand your regulatory environment and understand it well. And what does that really mean for you? Assess the key risks. I didn't touch about threat modeling, but threat modeling is essential to understand what the new attack services that the cloud can bring into you. Once you understand those things, you've got the baselines of understanding. Start to implement the right architecture. Use pre-tested architecture blueprints. Don't make it up. And then identify the third-party solutions to augment your security. Google Cloud does provide a lot, but doesn't provide everything. So make sure you have that identified. And then have monitor and audit direct, directly addressed. If you address these, you're well on the way to a secure cloud. All right, great. Well, thank you all for, uh, for coming and listening and uh, our dialogue. And thank our panelists. And uh, have a good rest of next. Not too much left. <laughs> <laughs>